Hi, everybody. So I want to start with a prayer. Um, this is just for a very specific person. If you happen to see this, uh, I just want you to know that I love you and I pray about you every day. And um, I know that you don't think Jesus is real or maybe you don't think that he's for you, but I want you to know that he is for you. He's always been for you. And we were put in each other's lives for so much more than to just be each other's codependent crutch. For a decade, we were put in each other's lives because ultimately God knew what was going to happen to me. And I believe that it's his will for it to happen to you as well. And he wants you to see the changes in my life. He wants you to, he wants me to be a witness to you of just how awesome he is and how good he is and how faithful he is. And he wants you to know that what happened to me can happen to you. You don't have to go on the way you're going on. You don't have to suffer like this. You don't have to keep trying and grasping at straws. He's right there and he's just extending his arms out to you. And he's saying that, you know, there's no one too far gone from my embrace. He loves you so much and I love you so much. And I pray that you would just come to a revelation of how very loved you are, because I promise there's no anxiety in the love of the Lord. And so now that all being said, um, I just felt led to start that way. And I pray that you have already, all of you watching now, have watched my first part of this, my testimony of how I came from new age to Jesus, the testimony of how I was born again, that went on for three hours. Um, so I had to obviously split it up into a part two. Now this is going to be more about my walk with the Lord from this point forward. So be sure to like the video if you haven't already and subscribe to the channel. Um, part one, if you haven't watched or listened, definitely go back and do that because honestly, this might not make as much sense without it. Uh, in that one, we covered my childhood, the new age journey, how I was born again. And now again, we're going to talk about my walk with the Lord, including how the devil took me from one deception to another, right? I went from new age and I fell right into another deception. Coming to Christ, of course, is not the deception, but it's the doctrine that I fell for, which was cessationism. And this is no hate or malice or judgment or criticism toward my cessationist brothers and sisters in the faith. But um, I pray that those of you that do lean toward that doctrine, I pray that you would watch this with just a humble heart and that after the stream, you would take it to the prayer closet, you would take it to the word of God and that you would just be open to the Lord and what he has to show you, not even me, just what he has to show you, because that's what I did to come out of that doctrine. Um, so this, you know, that's a whole testimony in and of itself because it shows the development of my relationship with the Lord, right? Because the first year of my walk, I was just a cessationist and I was full of fear. And, you know, the more I trusted in him, again, the more I humbled myself to things I did not understand, the more I just submitted to his way, the more I understood the totality of scripture, right? The less I conformed to the ways of the world as a result of that. And the less carnal that I became, the less fear that I had, the less sins that I struggled with, the less doubt that I had overall. And so therefore, the more him that I have and the less me that I have. And isn't that the gospel? Isn't that what John says? he must increase and I must decrease. So that has really been the fruit of turning away from being saved from that cessationist doctrine into really embracing the totality of scripture, right? The word is living. It's alive. It's active. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus's promises for his disciples weren't just for the 12. It was for all of us, his disciples which didn't end with just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? So yeah, I'm going to talk about the difference between the first year and the second year of being born again. Um, what happened after my water baptism, why, why I received deliverance, even though I was adamantly against it. Um, the difference fellowship has made, the difference proper discipleship has made, all for the better. Because God is faithful to answer prayers, right? And his word says that he's a good father, and that he's not going to give you a fish if you, or he's not going to give you a snake if you ask for a fish. And he's not going to give you a rock if you ask for bread. He's a good father. So he provides for his children. And so I pray that this will bless not only new believers. 
I pray that this will bless seasoned believers and I pray it would break off any spirit of religion in Jesus name. Okay. So just sort of picking up where I left off from last week's stream and sharing the new age to Jesus portion of my testimony. I, you know, as a whole, what I did when I received Christ as my Lord and Savior is I exchanged my truth for the truth. I exchanged my truth for the truth and I never looked back. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, so if there's anyone who is maybe thinking about coming out of new age, maybe you watch my last testimony, maybe you're still kind of straddling the fence. I need you to hear me and more importantly, hear the Lord when I say, Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus is the only way to healing. Jesus is the only way to truth because Jesus's name is truth. Okay, he is the only way to life. It's because he is the only way, period. He is the only way, okay? And now I want to be clear about something. Life doesn't automatically become perfect when you come to Christ. However, you do have perfection living inside of you because that's his spirit and he is perfect. And so that said, coming to Christ for a perfect life isn't the goal. Right? You don't accept Jesus as Lord because of what he can do for you. You accept Jesus because of who he is. And then he does a work in you. So blessing isn't the goal. Blessing is a byproduct of knowing him, which is the goal. Of restoration, which is the goal. For his glory. We are restored back to him for his glory. Why? Because he loves and he delights in you. First John 4.19 says, We love because he first loved us. So you may recall from last week, hopefully you do, how I told you when I first came to Christ, right? The anxiety, depression, intrusive thoughts all lifted overnight. I was miraculously delivered from all of the above. And that included being secure in my relationship with Mike, who is my husband now, was my fiance then. Because the intrusive thoughts that I had were surrounding him and our relationship. But I was actually content. So I mentioned last week that when he proposed to me, it was as steady as the, as the horizon of the ocean in the distance. It was just sound. And so after I came to Christ, our relationship actually started to fall apart worse than before. Despite that, I was more secure in it than I had ever been in all of the 14 years that I had known him. So like many of the things I already talked about, you know, I have an extensive video on this topic as well. You can go listen to it. Unequally yoked, dating or marrying an unbeliever as a Christian. That's on this channel. And the full story is there. As well as some biblical advice, if that's your situation, maybe you're in love with the Lord and your partner isn't, whether you're dating, engaged, or married, that would be a helpful video for you to check out. But in case you haven't heard the story before, the skinny of it is that I had the Holy Spirit and he didn't, right? I had Jesus and Mike wanted no parts of him. I started to live for the Lord and Mike continued to live for himself. And as we covered last week, Mike and I have known each other since high school. So he has quite literally witnessed me in every season of my life, despite childhood. And he has always supported and encouraged me through everything, through every season, except for the Jesus one, at least back then. He never cared, guys. He never cared about the new age stuff that I was in for almost 10 years. He did not care about the rituals. He did not care about the the sage cleansings in the house. He did not care about the Buddha heads on the wall or the Zodiac tapestries hung up in literally every room of the house. He didn't care about my strict yoga schedule. 
that I had to follow, by the way. He didn't care when I would spend hours just like held up in my office studying astrology. He didn't care when I would sit there and talk his ear off about the planets or the moon cycles or when I was spending money on Reiki sessions. He didn't care when I would, you know, put on videos about the Galactic Federation. He didn't care about the bookshelves that were literally full, like top to bottom with esoteric books about aliens and chakras and energy healing and constellations and Hindu philosophy and spirit guides, like none of it. He did not care, guys. He was so apathetic and yet encouraging. Like, yeah, go do your thing, babe. It was very much so just the supportive cheerleading boyfriend in the background. But when I got rid of it all, then he cared. Just overnight, he cared. This man, right? This man, who was then my fiance, had been my boyfriend for years before that, all throughout the New Age journey. He never once participated in any crystal healing in any capacity whatsoever. This man threw a fit when I told him I was getting rid of all the crystals. He was like, well, okay, this is kind of stupid. Can't we just keep a few? Like, even though, again, he literally never cared about the crystals. He never cared about them. And we got in a few arguments about it because when I tell you he was insistent that we keep some, like, he was insistent. He was, like, starting to pick them up on his own. Like, it was, it was insane to me to witness this happen because, again, he never cared until I renounced everything. And so even though he was insistent to keep a few, I was insistent to get rid of every last one, which is exactly what I did. Okay, and so all the Buddha heads came off the wall. All the tapestries came off the walls. All the crystals got removed from like every available space that they were on, you know, tabletop wise within the house. Um, all the books in trash bags. It was all gone. I got rid of everything and I burned it all as I shared in the last video, but... I started to hang up scripture around the house, right? I hung up crosses to replace the new age decor. And now he cared about my spiritual journey. Now it was a problem. Buddha was fine, but I hung up a cross and he said, I don't want to live in a church. But he was fine with living in a Buddhist temple, right, Mike? <laughs> He's laughing over there. But it's true. This is what happened. I hung up crosses to replace the new age decor. And he hated it. He hated the scriptures on the walls. He hated that there was a Bible on the living room table. Like now my spirituality was an issue because it's centered around Jesus. And you know why? You know why the reason Mike never cared before is because our demons were just fine coexisting. They were, they were chilling. They were fine. But as soon as I brought the Holy Spirit into the house, as soon as he moves in, Jesus Christ himself moves into our home, right? Mike's demons got so agitated. And he was like manifesting constantly. He was always mad at me. He was always nasty. He was always bitter. And he had never treated me like that before. Like in all the years that we knew each other. He started hiding things from me. His drinking habit got worse. I was finding empty bottles like almost every day in the house. He was staying up late playing video games. I know he was watching porn because I, I stopped having sex with him when I got saved. He was just spiraling. And I was better than ever. So, again, life isn't all sunshine and rainbows when you come to Christ. Especially when you're wrapped up in relationships where the common denominator was sin in much of the ways, right? Right? And so to make a long story as short as I can, it was like a really long 10 months, y'all, before Mike got saved, between the time of my salvation and his. But my best friend, Alyssa, right, who I talked about in part one, she prayed ceaselessly for me for a decade. And I figured, you know what? I can get on my face for this man that I love. And so I did every day. I prayed for him when it didn't look good or when it didn't make sense. I prayed for him every so hard every day when I knew he was up tr drinking the night before or doing something gross 
or acting like a little boy, like, and Mike's okay that I talk about all of this, by the way, he said, say whatever you want to say. Like, it's our testimony, even though it's his, but it's ours. And again, flood the chat right now and tell Mike you want him to come onto the channel. But yeah, I just kept, I just kept praying and praying and praying and praying. And you know, you can tell when someone's heart has really changed because before Christ, my thoughts about our relationship, me and his, were incredibly self-centered. All I ever did was have that back and forth battle with the intrusive, it was a demon, the, the intrusive thoughts in my head back and forth. Was I satisfied enough? Was I fulfilled? Was I this? Was I that? Me, 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 me. How can I have more? How can I be more satisfied? Is, is he doing this for me? Is he doing that for me? Like all these me, it was just, everything was orbited around me. And then after I came to Christ, there wasn't like a shadow of doubt that I was sincerely, deeply in love with this man. And all those thoughts, all those selfish thoughts became selfless because all I cared about at that point was him knowing Jesus the way that I had came to know Jesus. And it broke my heart every day. I was crying in my car every day as I watched this man just continue to reject the lover of his soul. It broke me. It broke my heart to know that there was an answer for every question that he was refusing to ask. And again, I wanted to marry him. But it also came to a point where I knew I couldn't follow through with it if he never came to Christ. So I just kept praying and praying and praying and praying because it wasn't even just about us getting married. It was about if we were to both die today, I'm not going to see him again. And it broke me. And so fast forward 10 months later, he in his own words could no longer deny it. And he came to faith. He came to repentance. He came to know Jesus. And so I want to say a key component to this miracle, and it's really layered, but the day he accepted Jesus, and I say accepted Jesus without saying as Lord, more on that in a moment, the day he accepted Jesus was the same day I had a conversation with Jesus saying, I'm just, I'm just going to give him up. Like, fine, fine. Like I am, this is a losing battle. I'm going to surrender this relationship. Right? I told the Lord, I'm going to give up my dream of moving to Tennessee. I'm going to give up my dream of getting married to Mike and starting a family and just all these things that I felt like it's like I, it's like I was I was like on a treadmill, just like running towards this like little dream that I just couldn't grasp. And that's just what it felt like. God was like dangling it in front of my face sort of thing. And I just said, fine, Lord, like I'm ready to lay it all down because I'm not willing to disobey you. I'm not willing to step into an unequally yoked marriage. And even though I was afraid, and I was like a baby Christian at the time, right? I was just getting to to really know how to trust God. That the relationship was still developing. And even in that like infancy, I still had to believe that God had a better plan for me. That he had a husband, that he was preparing for me. And I just knew I had to step boldly into faith in order to receive that promise. That if I was just clinging to this dead dream of Mike, I could never receive God's portion for me. And so I resolved to calling Mike that night and ending our relationship. Um, and so praise the Lord because the truth is he was preparing a husband for me. <laughs> and it was Mike after all. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I love you. And that night um, when Mike... Mike and I got on the phone that night. Um, you know, we had always worked things out when things were rough in the past. And because of that, I don't know if he thought I was going to break up with him or not. All I know is that he spoke before he gave me a chance to. And he started crying and he said, Jesus wouldn't leave him alone. He said it was just like sign after sign after sign. And he didn't know what accepting Jesus looked like, but that he was ready to because he just couldn't deny the reality of God or, or deny the reality of Christ. And as we were on the phone, he sends me a picture in his rearview mirror as he's sitting in his car of like the way the light was shining in his rearview mirror. It was a shape of a cross. Like it was just kind of amazing. 
and I was just sitting there weeping. And so now look, mine and Mike's testimony, it's really long, but it is similar in so much that we both accepted Jesus as a part of the equation at first. Because the last part, my first part of my testimony, right? I said that the first three months, it was like Jesus became a supplement for me, but he wasn't yet the supply until months later when I accepted him as Lord, when I actually repented. And it was kind of the same thing for Mike. So I don't want to tell the bulk of his testimony right now because this video is, there's a lot to get into and I don't want to be here for another three hours like we were last week, but I just want to let you know, as we lead into this discussion, he witnessed my deliverance, which if you've never heard that term, he saw demons cast out of me in person after I was a born again, baptized believer of Christ walking with the Lord for over a year, he saw demons come out of me. And that is the night he was born again. So that's the night he said, all right, Jesus, you're my supply. You're not just a supplement. And then we got married a little over a month after that, April 25th, 2023. And that was the night our daughter was conceived. <laughs> and she's downstairs sleeping and she's going to be 12 weeks old this upcoming Sunday because God is good. He's the best storyteller I know. <laughs> now, coming back to the topic of deliverance, first of all, I don't like calling it a ministry. I don't like saying deliverance ministry because it's not a ministry in and of itself. Deliverance is simply a part of the ministry of Jesus Christ, who, as we know from our Bibles, cast out demons. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He called sinners to repentance through faith in him alone. And he said that we, his disciples, would actually do the same works he did. And so again, deliverance is just a term for casting out demons. That's all. It's not any sort of fancy ministry or anything extra. It's just a part of the totality of Jesus Christ's ministry that he bestowed onto us as his disciples. So as a bit of a disclaimer, whether you're a new believer or a seasoned believer, you probably already know that deliverance, I use air quotes, is a bit of a hot topic in the church and there's a lot of controversy surrounding it in this debate of whether or not a Christian can have a demon. And honestly, I'm not here to convince you of anything or to debate theology or to get into the scriptures about this where it's it shows that we can. Because this video, okay, it's for the intent and purpose to share my testimony. I've never told this part. I've never told the after Christ part of my testimony at full length before. And, um, you know, the word of God says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, right? So that's what this is, the word of my testimony. And I want to say moving forward into this, that Matthew 7, 16 verse where Jesus says, we will know them by their fruit. I'm not saying this as like a humble brag or to even exalt myself. This is all glory to God because the truth is the fruit of my life since deliverance is good because Jesus is good. And it is no longer I that live but it is he that lives in me and I give all glory to God. And you know, what's really interesting is the first year of my walk with Christ, everyone was all happy for me. And, you know, I was really supported by and large in the Christian community for, you know, being born again, which of course we should all give thanks and praise to the King of Kings for that. But when I was denying deliverance and the spiritual giftings and all of those things, I was just, I was living at peace in so much as my online presence. I didn't really have any, any fiery darts coming at me at that time. However, in my personal life, there were still things I was struggling with. You know, I had the joy of the Lord now, but I was still struggling with certain sins and um, certain vices that no matter what I did in my flesh, no matter how much scripture I read, no matter how much I prayed, felt uncontrollable, right? And so I had like secret sin 
I'm just going to be honest. The first year of me having a public platform, and I repent for that. I've repented to the Lord, but I've never repented publicly. That I had secret sin the first year of my walk. And yet, everyone online loved me then. After I received deliverance, right? You know where I'm going with this? After I received deliverance, started speaking in the power of Jesus' name to set the captives free like he came to do. Saying that deliverance is for the Christian. Sharing how much it's it's helped me on my walk, not because of the prayer itself, but because of the name behind the prayer, because of the Holy Spirit who ministered the deliverance to me, right? Actually set free. I was actually set free all those things that I struggled with the first year gone right nailed to the cross with Jesus done set free now actually abiding in the vine and not just the vine and maybe a few things here and there of the world right actually embody abiding in the vine of Jesus full of joy unwavering faith peace all the time now everyone online is mad at me. Now I'm this, now I'm that. And yet personally, I'm closer with the Lord than ever because there's no fear anymore. And I'm going to talk in a minute how I had a lot of fear surrounding the topic of deliverance and the spiritual giftings in a moment. But it's like I was afraid to go there with the Lord. And once I went in there and really got to know him on that intimate level, everything has been really great, really great. And I don't suffer for my own sake. I don't suffer for my own sake. I suffer for Christ's sake, meaning persecution, right? As we are called to do biblically, but I don't suffer for my own sake. It's not just like this, wake up every day and have this sin conscience. It's I wake up every day and I get to be his. And so that's a really interesting distinction because a lot of people say, oh, she started out so solid and now she's off the wall. And oh, no, 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 no. What really when they're saying is, oh, I liked her better when she wasn't free. So anyway, my point in sharing that is this is not about deliverance itself, right? It's about the deliverer himself. It's about Jesus because... Hear me when I say this, deliverance doesn't save you. Deliverance sanctifies you. And I was one of those people before that didn't believe in it, which is really common amongst those of us who are coming out of new age. Ex new agers tend not to believe in deliverance. They don't believe in the giftings of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in healings or miracles. They don't believe that Jesus has given us any actual authority by the power of his Holy Spirit and so forth, right? The list goes on. Now, I'm going to elaborate that on that in a moment with my testimony, but I want to speak to this point for a moment because it's important for the context of the testimony. And I know it's not only ex-New Agers, ex Agers alone. I know that there are, in fact, a lot of people in the church, by and large, that just deny the, super, the supernatural. They reject the demonic. They reject the godly. They reject the spiritual giftings. They reject the prophetic. They reject miracles. Despite that, their Bible is full of them from Genesis to Revelation. They, what does this word say? Take on a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof, Right? And I want to say this, okay? New Agers aren't stupid. If you are in New Age right now, I you're not stupid, okay? And coming from that community myself, look, we, we just can't gaslight, hear me, church body, we can't gaslight this entire group of people by saying their gifts aren't real or that their experiences in the supernatural aren't real or that this didn't happen to them or that that didn't happen to them because the thing is it's all real right none of me sharing my testimony or exposing any of the deception of the new age is ever me saying that the supernatural components of the stuff 
doesn't actually exist. I'm not saying it's a fairy tale. Of course it exists. I know it exists because I experienced it too. Right? The reason I warn against this stuff, the reason God warns against this stuff is because it does exist. Right? It's not, the the reason God warns against it is not only for the sin aspect, as if that's not bad enough. It's also because of the danger. And just like any good father wants to protect his children from harm, how much more does our heavenly father want to protect us from harm? Right? The Bible is not a miserable rule book. It's just the guardrails to keep you from driving off a cliff. Okay. And I want to show you all some scripture here. This is Deuteronomy 18 verses 9 through 12. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And the Lord your God is driving them out before you. Okay. Leviticus 19.31. Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out. And so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Revelation 22.15. Outside meaning outside the kingdom of God, are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Galatians 5 verses 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, enviness, or I'm sorry, I lost my place. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Things like these, by the way. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so these are just a few examples of witchcraft and sorcery being condemned in scripture. So what am I saying? I'm saying witchcraft is real. Sorcery is real. Divination is real. It's all real. And every new age practice is divination. Divination is a sin. Divination is demonic. And it's real. I can't stress that enough. It's real. Okay. But something being real does not mean that it is the authentic Something being real does not mean that it is correct. Now, when we acknowledge it from this angle, we therefore are able to break down the reality that, okay, well, if there is a counterfeit version, what does that mean? Well, there must be an authentic. And that if there is a wrong way to operate in these gifts, then there is consequently a right way to operate in them. And so you see, a lot of New Agers come out of New Age and they swing from one extreme to the other like I did. And it's because they are oppressed by a spirit of religion. And I can speak from experience with this because that's what happened to me, right? The first year of my walk with the Lord, I was told from other ex-New Agers online to avoid churches that operated in deliverance or miracles or healing at all costs. I was told constantly that it was, quote, New Age infiltrating the church. Now, here's the thing. I knew how desperately I had been deceived in the past for having fallen into new age to begin with. I knew how terribly I had sinned against the Lord. I knew how lost I was before. I knew how even when I was in the trenches of new age, thinking that I was doing all the right things, that it was all light and love and pure intentions, that none of that actually mattered because it was evil. It was evil sin 
orchestrated by demons that were leading me to hell. And so I had the spirit of fear after I came to Christ because I was so terribly afraid of being led astray again. And I figured that these people online, I figured that these people online coming out of a similar background as me must know what they're talking about because they're walking with the Lord now too, right? So I sort of took them at face value without ever really consulting the Bible. I was almost treating these people like they were the Holy Spirit. I wasn't going to scripture when the truth is what we see in scripture <clears throat> is miraculous signs. It is demons cast out. It is healings. It is spiritual giftings. It is supernatural wonder from literally the first to the last page of scripture. And nowhere in scripture does it say that any of that has ceased. And so let me pause for water. <clears throat> And so I want to say that I think this is a major mistake that the body of Christ makes and the enemy loves it when we preach that these things have ceased <clears throat> because again, many of us that have come out of the new age, we now dedicate our time to talking about the dangers of it and rightly so, right? The dangers of witchcraft, the dangers of the occult, always calling everything a demonic counterfeit this and a demonic counterfeit that. But again, the thing with that is if new age is all a demonic counterfeit, then there must be a godly authentic. Because like I've discussed repeatedly already throughout my initial new age to Jesus testimony video, the devil cannot create. The devil cannot create. He can only distort. He can only copy. He can only pervert what already belongs to God. But unfortunately, there are many in the church and a lot of them with the same background as I had who are out here giving the devil all the credit. As if all these people in the new age harbor so much spiritual power, but then God's people have none at all. As if the devil is the only one in the business of spiritually equipping his people for what the Bible says is a war. Wrong. Okay, wrong. God has equipped his people spiritually. And I know some people will say, well, sola scriptura, like in response to that, meaning that the Bible is the final authority on these things. Yeah, let's consult the Bible then. First Corinthians. I said this, is one, one, this wasn't going to be a teaching, and here we are. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. By the way, manifestation is not a dirty word. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Mark 16, 17 through 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, says Jesus, shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So again, these are just a few of many verses. I don't want to get into a whole teaching on this right now. I want to share it because this is the point. The devil copies in the new age. And we spend so much time from new age to Jesus, and then dedicating our ministries to talk all about the counterfeits, to talk all about the demonic, the glory of the devil, but we never give the glory to God 
for what is rightfully his. And it's everything aforementioned in that scripture, the godly authentic that the devil stole. Example, Reiki is a counterfeit laying of hands and counterfeit deliverance, meaning it's a counterfeit of casting out demons. Astrology, tarot, mediumship, it's all counterfeit prophecy. Kundalini, the Kundalini spirit in yoga is a counterfeit Holy Spirit. Light language is counterfeit tongues, right? The list goes on here. Every miraculous sign of the devil is a counterfeit of a miraculous sign of God. Every supernatural gift of the devil is a counterfeit of a supernatural gift of God. Look, we even see this as an example in the Old Testament. When God has Aaron throw his staff in front of Pharaoh and it turns into a serpent only for the Egyptian sorcerers to come in and they do the exact same thing. They could perform the same miracle, but it was coming from a different source. Aaron's miracle came from God. The sorcerer's miracle does not. And guess what? Aaron's staff swallows up the other staff. Because even though the devil can perform counterfeit miracles, they don't hold a candle to the authentic miracles of God. Why do you think the devil wants to convince the church that that's not happening today? Because his counterfeit's going to get swallowed right up by the authentic, just like we see with Aaron and the staff. So how do we know the difference? How do we know the difference? The Bible says in Acts 1 that when this Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. Okay, the power doesn't come from you. It is the Holy Spirit alive in you, which you only receive through Jesus Christ. See, you have to belong to Jesus in order to receive his spirit. So all that being said, for the first year of my walk, as in love with Jesus as I was, okay, I was lulled to sleep when it comes to the wonder-working supernatural power of God's spirit. And I, I think this is, again, a mistake that we make within this New Age to Jesus community where we're always trying to warn New Agers about the dangers of the practices, but then it's like, what are we saying to them that when you come to Christ, your spirituality dies because, oh, that's not for today. No, like that's the wrong message to be telling them. Actually, your spirit comes to life like never before because you're actually alive in Christ. You have his Holy Spirit who is more powerful than any of the, the little demonic games that you're playing now. So I'm not saying we should preach to New Agers in a way that makes it seem appetizing to have power. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that we shouldn't dismiss the fact that power and authority in the Holy Spirit is in fact a byproduct of coming to Christ. Because the truth is, it is. Okay? So come early February 2022... That all changed, right? This this me being lulled to sleep thing, not believing in any of this. It changed when I was baptized. And by the way, if you're watching this and you haven't been baptized yet, you just, you need to be. You absolutely need to be. Okay, baptism doesn't get you to heaven, but baptism buries your old man, right? So until you get baptized, it's like you're carrying around the corpse. I say this all the time. It's like you're carrying around the corpse of who you were before you came to Christ and the new creation that he has resurrected you into, alive onto him, is just carrying this dead thing around with you at all times. And what happens when you're carrying around a corpse on your back? It's heavy and it stinks, right? So baptism buries the corpse. And your baptism is the same declaration of the ransacking of hell, the ambushing of hell and the conquering of darkness, the same way Jesus did on the second day between the cross and the resurrection. So again, if you're watching this video and you're ready to give your life to Christ tonight, your next step is to get baptized. Don't wait over a year like I did. Don't let the devil convince you to put it off like he did for me. It was excuse after excuse. I don't need to do that. I can do it another time. It has to be this way. It has to be that way. No, just do it because you're commanded to and because Jesus did it and we're to follow him. Because look, after I got baptized, everything changed. It's like I was born again again. 
And look, I didn't know any of this at the time of my baptism. I didn't know that baptism was more than just what I thought to be at the time, was just a physical confession and public profession of faith. It's so much more than that. There's power in those waters. There's power in those waters. And I had no idea. I had no idea just how supernatural being a born again believer in Jesus Christ actually is. And again, the baptism is what changed that because why? Because it wasn't the baptism itself. It was the work of the Holy Spirit in the water that quite literally drowned the spirit of religion that I had been carrying up until that point. Even on my walk with Christ, by the way, the spirit of religion that followed me from the new age to Christianity. It's the same one, by the way, that plagued the Pharisees, right? Because think about the Pharisees. They had the Messiah standing right in front of them and they couldn't see him. They witnessed him. They witnessed him in the flesh. They witnessed him in the flesh and yet their spirit could not receive him, right? And it's that religious spirit, that intellectual, well, what about this? What about that rigidity? It's what had me blind to the reality of the supernatural as a Christian, to deliverance, to all of these things that I was told to reject for so long coming out of New Age by former New Age teachers. And I just sort of found myself following them because I figured they knew what they were doing again because they had come from the same space as me. Maybe they were a bit of an idol to me. And, you know, I pray for, I pray for all of those people. Like, I love them dearly. But the fact is, it comes back to me not testing these things against the word. I was just sort of taking all these teachers at their word, which by the way, I never want you to do with me. Please take all of this to the word. Take it to your prayer closet. I always say take things to the prayer closet before the comment section. Because I mean, the truth is, right? That spirit of religion, it's a spirit of pride and of fear. It operates through pride and through fear. And what happened to me and what I think happens to a lot of ex-New Angers when they come to the Lord is like you're just hit again with this supersonic reality check. When you come from New Age to Jesus, you're hit with a supernatural supersonic reality check of how massively deceived you were in New Age. And you recognize what a depraved sinner you were. You recognize how misguided and off track you were, despite that you thought you were on the right track, despite that you actually thought you were working for God like I did in New Age, and you thought you were a good person. Like, then you know the truth. You come to know Jesus, and you know that all of the above was actually a lie the whole time. It gives you this godly sorrow that the devil will use for guilt and condemnation if you're not careful. Because you now have a repentant heart and you do have that earnest desire to live pure for the Lord because you fall in love with him and you want to follow him. And you never want to be deceived again. I get it. I never wanted to be deceived again. And I'm not even sure I, I realized in hindsight how scared I actually was but that's the truth, right? I was terrified into being tricked. I was terrified of the devil taking advantage of me again. I was terrified more than anything of sinning against God again. I was terrified of doing wrong by Jesus when he had literally just saved my life. Like, I don't want to sin against this man again, this God. He is holy and perfect and pure. And I went so long using him as an ascended master in the new age. I'm not possibly going to come into this Christianity thing and start casting demons out in his name. Do you see how the devil just takes you from that space to that space? And so it's like you just subconsciously or maybe consciously put these walls up, right? You put these walls up and you block out the supernatural world that you were once so engulfed in and you write everything off that's portrayed as quote unquote charismatic, even in the slightest fraction as just demonic. Why? Because that's what other people in the Christian community are saying. They're denying the miracles. They're denying the signs and the wonders. They're denying anything that they can't rationalize or intellectualize or, you know, it's just crazy to me because the fact of the matter is Everything about salvation is supernatural, right? When you really come down to it, everything about my my salvation was supernatural. 
to be delivered from depression and anxiety and intrusive thoughts literally overnight after a lifelong struggle with those things, it is a miracle. But he gave me eyes to see. He gave me eyes to see and yet I was still blind for another year. I was still blind for another year. And you know, what changed was not the Bible because the word has always been the same. It was not God because he's the same yesterday and today and forever. It was not Jesus that had the change. It was not the Holy Spirit. They've always been the same, perfect, holy, and almighty. It was my positioning that had to change. The Bible is always alive and active, and I was the one treating it like it was just a study guide. Okay? As descriptive rather than prescriptive. And again, God was always the same yesterday, today, and forever. I was the one thinking he only reserved that for scripture alone. That it started at Genesis, ended at Revelation, closed from there. Not for today. Jesus had never ceased the commands that he gave the disciples. I was the one who had to realize he was talking to all disciples, including me, not just the immediate 12. And the Holy Spirit has never stopped endowing believers with power, like it says in Acts 1.8. I was the one who had to believe that he endowed me with that too, because I belong to him. So what am I saying? I had to get humble. I had to get humble, guys. I had to get on my face and weep before the throne room of God at the feet of King Jesus, begging him to show me that somehow in all the fear I had of being deceived again like I was in New Age, I had to get at the Lord's feet and say, God, I'm scared of being deceived again like I was in New Age. But could it be that I'm actually already being deceived again by not believing in this stuff? What if I'm so afraid of disobeying you that I'm actually already in a heart posture of disobedience because I'm quenching your spirit? What if, God? And so I asked him to show me if deliverance was biblical, I mean, I was weeping. I asked him to show me if I was wrong about it because I had spent time online just following the steps of others, like responding to comments saying, no, that's not Christian can have a demon X, Y, Z. And, you know, I, I just, I just told God, I wanted to know the truth. I just wanted to know the truth. I, and I didn't want to suffer anymore because the thing is after my baptism, like I already mentioned at the beginning, I started, I, I still had some struggles that I just, you know, ultimately water down to the thorn in my flesh because I had no context of what that verse actually meant. And if you go back and you watch my video that I did with my friend Nayla recently of how to walk by faith, we break down the thorn in the flesh verse extensively. It's about persecution. Okay. Anyway, I was like, well, these things are just a thorn in my flesh. I'm always going to struggle with sin. Like the just things that they teach you in church. That you're just always going to struggle. It's always going to be, you're always going to be depraved. There's no hope for you. Like, it's just, you know, you say a prayer of salvation and then you wait to go to heaven and, you know, you just read your Bible and sit on your hands the rest of the time. Like, that's what I thought. And so there were just things I struggled with, right? And after my baptism, things somehow got worse. Not with the depression or anxiety. Like, I did, I was fully delivered from that, like, the first time. But it was like with sin stuff and it was just beyond my flesh, okay? It wasn't just the sin nature. After my baptism, for instance, I was really convicted to just get rid of weed once and for all, to be just done with it. Whereas in the first year of my walk, like I would be hit with these little pangs of conviction, but then I would always justify it with like, well, God made this and he doesn't mind if I enjoy his creation recreationally, cringe. Um, or my favorite was, well, there's grace, there's grace. I'm always going to sin. There's just grace. And, you know, this is like a little thing that I do. So, you know, that's really sick to even say out loud that I was, I, I wasn't fully repentant in that area. And I would go through these phases 
during the first year of trying to quit, but like I literally couldn't. And then after I got baptized, I was like, I was like back to where I was before I got saved with weed. Like it was suddenly just, it wasn't just the thing that I did at night. Suddenly I'm like smoking during the day, which like it was never really a thing that I did. And you know, maybe before, after I got saved, it was like just something I did after work. It was back to being consistent after I got baptized. It was weird. And I just couldn't like, this is what I mean. It was beyond my flesh. It was like a compulsion that would just overcome me. And it was persistent. And it was more than a temptation because the word of God says he will never give us, give us a temptation that he can't lead us out of. But it was something where like, I couldn't be led out of it. And even though, though the Holy Spirit had my spirit, there was something that was manipulating my, my soul, like my, my will and my emotions and my mind. And it just kept me coming back to weed, like to the point where I'm literally throwing it out, going back to sit on the couch and just like sitting there like this. And then I go to the trash can and pick it out. And you know, the same with binge eating, like binge eating, I hate it. I, I always hate it. And it was something I struggled with before I got saved and after. It got better when I got saved, but it didn't go away. And I hated doing that because I knew it didn't glorify God. And it was weighing down the temple of my body. That was now the temple of the Holy Spirit. But again, there was something in me that physically could not stop. And the urge, by the way, to binge eat was always strategic. Okay. It was always before something ministry like that I was doing. And I've never told this before, but like the reason I started my podcast, I planned to launch my podcast February 22nd, 2022. I didn't end up launching it until a few days after because I had a terrible binge eating session that left me down and out for days. That's the truth. And the reason, if you've ever seen my Michael Knowles interview, the reason my face looks so puffy is because I had a binge eating episode the weekend before. Like, that's just the truth. It's not ever something I wanted to participate in, but I literally could not help it. I could not help it. And after my baptisms, those were the primary two things that they were a struggle during the first year of my walk. It's just the thorn in my flesh. After I got baptized, it was like beyond a struggle. It was like insufferable. Like I, I didn't even, I didn't, I had no idea what was happening. I had no idea what was happening. I was like spiraling. And if you followed me for a long time, you would, you'll remember back in January of 2023, where I was offline for that whole month. I was just offline and, and February too, because it all just ramped up tenfold after I got baptized. Right. Again, I was digging weed out of the trash. I was eating three bags of candy in one sitting while my husband who was then my fiance when, when he wasn't there, like with tears streaming down my face because I didn't want to do it. And I knew I would feel disgusting after. And then I felt disgusting after and I hated it. And then guess what happened? I received deliverance and those two things I was completely set free of in Jesus name, completely set free of in February of 2023. And so I'll talk a little bit about my deliverance. So it gets to the point after I'm baptized, I'm suffering. I'm on my face before God saying, God, if I'm wrong, if, if this deliverance thing, like if there's something to it, I need you to show me the truth because I don't want to suffer like this. And here's the thing, guys, God doesn't want you to suffer like that either. So I had this really good friend, Taylor, and we had just recently, I guess we weren't really good friends at that point, but we knew each other in Nashville. Like we both lived in, in the Nashville proximity. I knew she had been a Christian her whole life and like knew about deliverance and all these things. So I reached out to her, we got connected. She prayed over me. And at the same time, people are sending me Isaiah Saldivar's videos. And I know a lot of you came from his channel. Um, so I actually went on Isaiah's Instagram because I was going to message him after I'd watched some of his content. And this is so cool how God works because I went on Isaiah's Instagram and it said, follow back, like as, as in he had already followed me. And I was like, okay, sweet. Follow back. I go to message him. There are messages from him in my DMS, just sitting there that I had never seen. And they were from like, um, they were after the Michael Knowles interview because he had seen it. 
So these like six month old messages from Isaiah in my DMs, like, hey, I saw, you know, it's really cool. I would love for you to come on my podcast and share my testimony. Later, when he and I like talked about this, he thought I was ignoring him because he thought that I thought he was nuts because he knew like who I was kind of involved with. And he figured that I was just consuming all the content that he's like a, her a heretic and all these things. So it's just kind of funny. But I messaged him and I was like, hey, like I've been watching your stuff and we got connected right away. He actually did end up praying deliverance over me as well because I had deliverance prayer a total of three times. And um, that night with Taylor, the first time was the night I was completely set free from binge eating and, and marijuana. And look, I was manifesting demons and I didn't even know they were there because remember, I didn't believe this because I couldn't have a demon because these people online are saying I can't have one because I'm a Christian. And yet here I am, they're manifesting, I'm crying, they're coming out, I go home, I throw out the weed, I never binge eat again. If that's really demonic, explain the fruit of that. Because the word says, Jesus himself says, when the Pharisees are accusing him of casting out devils by the devil, he says Satan can't cast out Satan. So explain to me how a demon was the one that made the demonic stuff flee and in turn, I actually became more holy and more submitted to God. Like, what does the devil have to gain from me being closer to Jesus and actually walking out the freedom that he paid for on the cross? No, like, it just doesn't add up, right? And so when I had, fast forwarding a little bit, after that, I just, I prayed, I had Isaiah pray deliverance over me. The, the kind of last of it, or I'm sorry, no. I'm confusing it. Isaiah was the last deliverance that I had. I'll get there in a minute. I'll explain why I felt like I needed one more deliverance prayer. And before I know people are going to clip that and be like, see, this is the thing about deliverance. You always got to go back for more. You always got to go back for more. It's just like new age. It's just like new age. It's like, actually sanctification is a lifelong process because we don't have our resurrected bodies yet. And so let's just cancel that right then and there. It's not that you need deliverance every week, but my best friend's dad put it really nicely. Once when I first got saved, he said, he said, when you spend a long time junking up your house, meaning just, you know, everything, your mind, your body, your everything. When you spend a long time junking up your house with so much stuff and hoarding all this sin and depravity and, and these, and these addictions and these, and these attachments and these strongholds, he said, it takes a while for the Lord to clean house. And he didn't know at the time that I would later apply that to my experience with deliverance. So anyway, I don't have to over explain myself. This is my testimony that we overcome the evil one with by the blood of the lamb. So hallelujah for that. Um, yeah, again, haven't touched weed since haven't been jate since. And again, it's not because of my friend that prayed over me. It's not because of the ministry of deliverance. It's because of the deliverer. It's because of Jesus. It's by the power of his name, uh, by his Holy spirit. And so I used to actually be one of those people that would say like deliverance, you know, you, you probably think you need deliverance because the cross isn't enough for you, which is rude to say, first of all, but I understand now that it just comes from a place of ignorance and pride and, and look, no hate toward anyone. I'm not saying like, you're so full of pride. I'm saying that that actually could come from a place where you don't even realize you have the pride because I didn't, I didn't realize that I had, I had a heart full of pride when it came to this topic. And be because I actually did have a genuine heart, again, where I wanted to be obedient to the Lord. But the thing is, within that intention of wanting to be obedient, the fear was still there. And because I was afraid of being deceived again, because I was afraid of the supernatural, and I wanted nothing that even remotely resembled anything that I was doing in the new age, I had pride. And I rejected the possibility. You know, even though I talk all about these counterfeits, well, you know what? What about the authentic? Again, and it's ironic because... For the entire first year, that's all I did was preach about the counterfeits, how everything the devil does is a perversion of God's design. And yet here I was rejecting God's design <laughs> by never acknowledging what that authentic actually was. It was all just counterfeit, counterfeit, counterfeit. Okay, so then what exactly is it a counterfeit of? What exactly is it a counterfeit of? And when the Lord gave me that revelation, it changed everything. And I came to understand that I was giving way too much credit to the devil 
as a cessationist and a former occultist by acknowledging that all these people in the new age had spiritual power and authority given to them by the devil while I was simultaneously denying that God himself is not only also in the business of gifting his children with supernatural power and authority, but God is actually the one who started the business. Okay, the devil is the one who corrupted the business plan. He's the one that copied. So not only is it completely incongruent with scripture to say that God doesn't endow his children with spiritual gifts and authority by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's also just incongruent with God's character overall. Because again, he's a good father. He wouldn't just allow the devil and the devil's army, like New Agers, to go into battle into the spiritual war, fully equipped without equipping his own children. And I know people will say, yes, well, the finished work on the cross is enough. That is our equipment to which I say, yes. And deliverance is not in spite of the cross, guys. Deliverance is because of the cross. Spiritual gift things are not in spite of the cross. It's because of the cross. Amen. So yeah, it was after my baptism that I finally came around to deliverance and had demons cast out of me that I didn't know were there because look, I know a lot of people have trouble reconciling the fact that a Christian can have a demon if they have the Holy Spirit, but just to make a really long teaching condensed into a few sentences, the Holy Spirit fills that. He fills our spirit. Our spirit is sealed when we are his, but we are still in these bodies. They aren't our resurrected bodies yet. So this flesh and this soul is still susceptible, is still susceptible, that's a tongue twister, to the corruption of the world that we are in, but no longer of. And that's not a scary thing. It's not a scary thing, okay? It's incredible because the power of the cross is unmatched. And guess what? The word says that you are seated in heavenly places with Jesus. So when you go into deliverance, you are already victorious. You've already won. Those demons stand no chance. But if you don't believe that, if you don't believe that, then what? Okay. So see, because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he took a pit stop at the whipping post. And Isaiah 50, 53, 5 says that he was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. So if sin was all he wanted us to be free from, he wouldn't have also taken the whipping to heal us by his stripes but the bible says he did that too and so ever since my deliverance over a year ago now the lord has sent me a blaze with a fire that is inextinguishable and it perfectly embodies hebrew hebrews 12 29 um where it says our god is an all-consuming fire but here's the thing about it, right? The sanctification process is beautiful because he doesn't just refine us in that fire. He also refines us in the glory. He refines us in the glory. And all of this, by the way, I'm not insinuating that we need to be chasing after spiritual gifts. And I'm not saying we need to chase after deliverance. I'm not one of those people that think you need deliverance every week, okay? You shouldn't need deliverance every week because if you need deliverance every week, the word says truth sets you free. So if you need that every week, it's because you're still believing a lie because the truth does set you free. And the truth is Jesus is the one that sets you free. So look, all this other stuff, right? Casting out demons, healings, gifts. It's all a byproduct of knowing the father. It's a byproduct of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. It's a byproduct of complete unwavering faith, unwavering faith in Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh. And our hope is not in what he can do for us. Our hope is in who he is. It just so happens that all the aforementioned is the totality of who he is. He is a deliverer and he is a healer. And so I want to make that clear because I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. And more importantly, I don't want anyone to misunderstand the gospel. I want everyone to know that the gospel, the thing is, is that I just want everyone to know that the gospel is more than just being forgiven and getting our ticket to heaven. The totality of the gospel includes forgiveness and eternity and restoration. Yes, but it also means freedom. The gospel is freedom. And freedom only comes from the restoration to the Father. But it's so much 
bigger than an altar call or a prayer letting Jesus into your heart. And knowing this changed everything for me. Why? Because knowing him changes everything for anybody. And the Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. So it's not because of some prayer or some gifting that any of this happened as the continuation of my testimony after I was born again. It's because of his love. Because his love cast out the fear that I had of the supernatural and actually allowed me to have the totality of what he paid for on that cross. And that's what I always want to bring it back to because my entire life is truly that. It's not a testimony of his miracles. It's a testimony of his love for me. His love for you. His love for all of us. He is so, so, so good. He is so good. So as, as moving forward, coming out of cessationism, right? So I had an experience being delivered again at the come out in Jesus name movie. And I wasn't expecting that to happen to me at all. I actually had it in my mind. Oh, Mike's going to come and get delivered tonight. Sweet. Guess what happened? I start manifesting in the movie theater. The Kundalini spirit was the, was like the predominating strong man of that night. From yoga, by the way, which I hadn't done in like, what, 18 months at that point? Okay, maybe less. Like 16, 14 to 16 months. It doesn't matter. I had been done with yoga since I had been born again. At this point, I'm a baptized believer of Jesus Christ manifesting a kundalini spirit in a movie theater on the floor. As my then fiance sits there and watches this happen to me, okay, And that's going to be important in just a moment, but that left. And then one more prayer with Isaiah where abandonment left, which was like the childhood spirit from the fatherlessness that I talked about in the first, um, in the first part of this testimony. Now, after my deliverance, I had the whole, I've been baptized in the Holy spirit, all these things. And I was visiting a church with my friend Taylor. She introduced me to a girl I had never met before. She's like, this is a good friend of mine. I'd love for you to meet her. This girl looks at me, says, the Holy Spirit is resting upon you. All you have to do is open your mouth. I didn't know what that meant, but in faith, I I said, okay, I closed my eyes. I opened my mouth. I started praying in tongues. I didn't even, like, I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know what that really was. I had like maybe heard it here and there, but I never really knew. And it just was happening. It just was happening. And I will tell you, praying in tongues, you don't have to pray in tongues to have the Holy Spirit, but the Bible says that praying in tongues is evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. And I would encourage you to ask God for that gift because praying in tongues is really just like, it's like, It's the Holy Spirit praying through you. Paul says in scriptures that he's grateful he prays in tongues more than anyone because it's just really just, it's just you and God. Like it's, it's really special. I love praying in tongues. Um, so now I want to get back to before that happened. This is just like my whole journey out of cessationism, right? So at this point I'm like, all right, no going back now. (laughs) <laughs> clearly because God changed my mind because just like with new age, you changed my mind because you changed my heart because I was humble. Come out in Jesus name night at the movies. Again, I have this mindset that, um, well, Mike is going to get delivered tonight. Sweet. I get delivered that night. Mike is sitting there and I, you know, because the thing is going through deliverance, like you don't completely black out at least I didn't completely black out. Like I'm still like aware of what's happening, even though I I, like can't explain what's happening at the same time. Cause it's like you and a demon at the same, it's just crazy. And, um, I mean, it's, it's, that's what happens when the Holy spirit moves upon you. It's just like the demon's got to go. So I'm like aware in the back of my mind that like Mike is there probably thinking like, this is insane. Sure enough. That's what he was thinking. This is only like a month out from our wedding. And he left the movie theater that night. And when he left the movie theater, I'm not going to tell this whole story because he's going to tell it. But what happened was he received Jesus that night because he had a physical encounter 
with Jesus Christ. He had a physical encounter. I never even had that. Like he had a physical encounter with Jesus Christ that night. He was so freaked out by the deliverance that he was thinking we couldn't get married, all these things. Jesus just, like I said before, how I started this, Mike had accepted Jesus months before that. And again, Mike will tell this in detail. There was a lot he was struggling with in that in-between space though, between the acceptance as Jesus versus accepting him as Lord and being born again, being saved by grace through faith. It's like the first time Mike kind of understood the invitation was there. But this night he accepted the invitation, right? That's the best the Holy Spirit just gave me that. That was good. Would you say that's true? Yeah. So um, he, had a, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ that night and he was born again. And then he came. We just, we reconciled after that. He knew what happened to me in that movie theater. He knew that was God. Like after it happened, even though he was so freaked out, but he knew that was the Holy Spirit. Like he knew that was God. And this is why this is, there are many reasons why you can't talk me out of this. One of the biggest is because the Bible says you will know them by their fruit, right? And so again, the fruit of my life since deliverance is just, it's a, it's, it's, it's the result of abiding in the vine, but it's not just the fruit of my life. It's actually the fact that Mike was saved. Like the fruit of my deliverance wasn't just my fruit. My husband got saved and then we got married and now we have a daughter. And again, I'm not saying it's because of the deliverance. It's because of the deliverer. Jesus did that. Jesus did that. Okay. And all glory to God, all glory to God for that. And so aside from coming out of cessationism, since my baptism and the deliverance, I have also just come into incredible fellowship and proper discipleship. Okay. Proper discipleship. So some of the incredible fellowship, as I already mentioned, like Taylor and Isaiah, and, um, just like that whole, that whole circle who really took me under their wing in many ways, um, meeting a lot of really great friends here in the Nashville proximity. He's in the chat right now, TJ. Um, this is the discipleship part. I'm getting to him in a minute. Nayla also, I wish she was here tonight, but Nayla, a lot of you guys already know me and Nayla is like the dynamic duo. Like I, I feel like at this point it's like a package deal, but she came to visit us over the summer and I thought this was just going to be like, you know, well, um, okay. This is just like a quick visit. She just is in the States. She needs some place to say fine, whatever. So she stays with us. And, um, wow, it was so much more fruitful than I could have ever imagined. Like we, our fellowship was so good. We were praying together every day, studying scripture together. We were challenging each other with different, um, theology. And we just, we grew so close because of our bond in Christ. And it was just, Nayla is here. And it was just <laughs> really, it was just really beautiful. Like we got so close and it just quickened me in the spirit. Our fellowship quickened me in the spirit. Um, because I had been missing that. And there was this one day in the car, we're driving together, me and her just singing worship. And it hit me that I had been connected with all these people online for so long. Like since I was born again, I had this huge community online, but it hit me as she's next to me in the car. Like I've never had a friend that came out of new age, like had spent her whole life so far away from God. And then all of a sudden, like just overnight, just born again, like in, on fire and in love with Jesus. Like me and Taylor, like Taylor grew up Christian, dabbled in, in the occult briefly and came back. But me and Nayla were like born and raised so far from God <laughs> that to anyone in the outside, it's like, how could those girls have found the Lord? And we're just sitting in the car together and I just look over her and I'm like, I'm so grateful for you. Like I've never had a friend like this. Like, and so God gave us that fellowship and I love our testimony as friends because it could only be from God because she's from the literal other side of the planet. 
I said the word planet again. Oh me, oh my. She's from the other side of the pyramid. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so, I'm so, I'm having, Mike is just staring at me like, why are you saying that? Anyway, um, I'm kind of I'm kind of toying with the maybe we are, you know. I'm not going there. Anyway, so Nayla and our fellowship was wonderful. Now, okay, so fellowship is really important. That is something that was different from the first year of my walk. I didn't really have that one-on-one -on -one fellowship. Even my best friend, Alyssa, who had been praying for me all that time, she was way up in New Hampshire when I was in Pennsylvania. So I never had that like close fellowship. And now not just Nayla, but like other people around me, my friend Alexis, like these people around me, this community, right? This community of people like God, why do you think Jesus had 12 disciples and not just one? Like he calls us into community. Now I started praying over the summer that I really want, I really want a mentor. Like Lord, I really want to cite, I want to be discipled properly. Like I don't want to fall. I don't want to, you know, my platform's growing. I'm, I'm doing this thing online and I know it's, it's, it's important. Like Paul and Timothy, like, I know it's important to have a, to have leadership, especially for my husband, because I can't disciple my husband, right? You know, he got saved after me. So it's like, I don't want to say he's behind me, but you know what I mean? It's just like that he had questions that I felt like I can't teach you these things. You need a man to be discipling you. So I just started praying like, God, we need discipleship. Like we need like a spiritual father and a spiritual mother, for lack of a better term. Like we need that. <clears throat> so all of a sudden this man comes <laughs> into my life. <laughs> I'm only joking because he's in the chat. Um, so we're, we go to an event at our friend Taylor's like, um, church, I don't church building place. Uh, it's, it's not a church, but it's not, I'm sorry. We go to this event that Taylor's hosting and Mike Signorelli was there. And so TJ was there. I met TJ that night. Apparently I don't remember Mike remembers, but we met TJ that night at the Mike Signorelli event. Later, Mike Signorelli invited us to the Domino Revival premiere in October. And that was October 4th. I was like pregnant. Um, and we go to New York for the premiere. We see TJ there. TJ introduces himself as though we should already know who he is, which Mike did, but I didn't remember. And so he's laughing in the chat. He said, this man. <laughs> so we, yeah, he, he, we just reconnected there. And TJ said, if you watch our interview together on my channel, it's the last video that I did right before I gave birth. I am like so pregnant in that video. It's, um, ex convict turn. I forget what they even, I'm really good at knowing my own content. I forget what the episode's called, Mike. <laughs> it's, can you find it and like link it? Um, Mike's going to link that episode in the chat of, with me and TJ. It's like ex-convict something, but TJ's testimony is awesome. But he shares in that video together that the, he felt the Lord was telling him at the Domino Revival premiere, he says rejection. Um, he says that, um, the Lord told him at the Domino Revival premiere that, you know, you need to keep an eye on these two, like specifically me and my husband. He didn't know that I had been praying for discipleship, but the Lord started telling him, I want you to disciple them. So TJ has been saved since 94. So he, and he's a pastor, like he is, you know, he's a, he's a veteran in the faith. Um, we, we connect again when he, again, at Taylor's family's event plaza shared his testimony there. We connected there that night. And again, I told this, this story in length on with the interview with him, but ex-convict tells all it's very simple that's what it's called and so we connected there he met mike the rest is history him and mike are like very close now me and him are very close his wife is awesome um we love going over to their house and we fellowship with them and he's ta he's taught mike a lot with bible study and just like one-on-one -on -one stuff like he is the answered prayer. So if you have not been praying for discipleship, you need to be praying for that because he's made a big difference. If I like have a question about something, if I need to like a discernment check on something, there's been a couple times where he's like called me out on things like, Hey, like that, like you could say this differently. You could say that better, like approach it this way instead of that way. And I just was missing that the first year on my walk. Um, so he's just been such a godsend, literally. And we love him so much and he's amazing. 
Um, and just, yeah, it, it's made, it's made a huge difference. It really has made such a huge difference. So all of that, all of this to be said now, um, a major difference overall between the first and the second year of my walk with the Lord, it's the intimacy. Okay. The intimacy in my relationship with with God. Okay. Because there's no fear anymore. Like I said, in the first year, there was still that undertone of fear because I just didn't want to be deceived again. I didn't want to be deceived again, but now there's nothing but glory. There's nothing but glory to God. And again, there's something I really want to stress here is new agers think that, okay, so let me back up. Last night at our church, pastor was preaching about how heaven isn't boring. And he said, if you think heaven is boring, it's because your walk as a Christian is boring. He's like, I don't believe we really rest in peace, right? Meaning that there's more to do than heaven than rest. Like heaven is, is, is alive and exuberant and, and joy, joyful and laughter and music and service. Like and so when he said that, I got to thinking, like, it's true. Like, there is nothing about being a Christian that's boring. And so going back to what I said at the beginning, how a mistake we make in the church, especially as former New Agers, when we kind of welcome these, for lack of a better word, dead doctrines of you can't have power in the Holy Spirit, Deliverance is you, is not for a Christian. The supernatural gifts, the giftings of the Holy Spirit are not for today. When we adopt that, the message that we're sending to people is that you have all the power and the spirituality and all of the things in the new age, but when you come to Christ, you don't. And that's a mistake, again, not because we should be trying to entice people with signs and wonders but because what we're doing is we're telling them that a byproduct of knowing jesus does not include signs and wonders which just isn't biblically accurate it's just not biblically accurate we're not telling them the truth so again we don't come to jesus because of what he does for us we come to him because of who he is but who he is, is alive. Who he is, is the same God made flesh who said, better I leave so that you can have my Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit is the one that he gave us, that he said, you will do what I did even greater, he said. You have authority. You are seated in heavenly places. You can trample the head of every serpent and scorpion. Go make disciples, go baptize, go lay hands, go cast out demons, go heal the sick, go, go do these things in my show. You know, don't just tell people who I am, show them who I am. And I think we do a disservice to the new age community by preaching that everything in new age is a counterfeit. Yes. But then we don't talk about the godly authentic. We don't talk about the godly authentic when there is one. And again, you just can't gaslight this community of people that know that the supernatural is real. You, you can't. You can't treat them like they're stupid. You can't treat them like it's all invalid because it is valid. But you have to be able to explain that it's, it's valid, but it's not correct. Here's what's correct. There's power in the name of Jesus. You can only have his Holy Spirit if you belong to him. Anything else is operating under a spirit of witchcraft. If it's not of the Holy Spirit, it is therefore by process of elimination an unholy spirit. But again, all of this comes back to that restoration, okay? We are restored when, when we belong to Christ, when we are saved by grace through faith, we are restored to the image and likeness of God. We are made in his image and likeness. Right, being 
Christian is being conformed to his image, which means we be like him and we do what he did and think how he thinks. We feel how he feels. And again, do what he did. Do what he did. We cast out demons. We don't spend time online fighting people about whether or not we can have a demon. We just cast them out. We see people walk free. Not because the cross isn't enough, but because the cross is so enough that it actually enables the freedom. It enables the authority to tell those devils to go in Jesus' name. And now back to the major point that I wanted to stress all along is that we're not chasing after signs and wonders and miracles and deliverance and healing. We are seeking the face of God because he is perfect. He is holy. He is only good. He is only faithful. He was, he is only just, he is only righteous. He is only true. And he is worthy. He is so worthy. We come to Jesus for who he is, not for who he does or for what he does. And you know why we have the ability to come to him? It's because he loves us. So all the aforementioned, the signs, the wonders, the healings, the deliverance, it is a byproduct of knowing that love, that unconditional, sacrificial, overwhelming John 316 love. Okay. Because Jesus loved me enough to save me from myself when I was on my kitchen floor and I asked him to, when I was still a depraved occultist that didn't know any better. In all his grace and love, he extended the invitation because he died on a cross for me because he loved me. And then in all his grace and his love, he put up with me for those three months where I thought I could be a Christian astrologer. And then in all his grace and his love, he convicted me by this Holy Spirit that I was a sinner and he drew me to repentance. And his all, in all his grace and love, he led me through the wilderness for the first year of my walk as I had so much fear of being deceived again because he saw my heart in that. He knew I just wanted to be obedient to him. And it says in his word that he exalts the humble. And when I tell you I had to get so humble when I asked him about the truth on deliverance, I had to just admit again, like, Lord, am I wrong again? Am I wrong again? It truly goes to show that we can do nothing in our own strength. And it was that love that the truth was revealed to me. And perfect love casts out all fear. So guess what? The fear of the supernatural left. The fear of, could I actually have a demon? Left. The fear of, I'll always struggle? Left. The fear of, the fear of doing wrong? Left. Because I realized I was no longer relying on my own strength. Whereas much of the first year of my walk was actually still works-based and I didn't realize it. You know, people say deliverance is works-based, but the truth is waking up every day and trying in all your might not to sin and not to struggle, that's works-based because you're trying. It's, it's in your own might. But to actually be free, to actually walk in grace... That's because the love, the revelation of the love has cast out the fear that makes me feel like I have to do all that work. It was workspace for me to try in my own strength for that first year to just blame everything on the thorn in my flesh, to just say, well, I'll always struggle. Well, I'll always be a sinner. It took a humble heart to just, Admit I was wrong again. 
admit the possibility that I was wrong again, that in all my fear of being wrong again, wow, could it be that I'm actually wrong again? And you know what? I was. And he is faithful to reveal those things to you when you seek his face. You know, if we can get out of our own way and just let him have his way, life is so full. Life is so full and he saved me from myself. He saved me from hell. He saved me from all the bondage. He saved me from the demonic influence, the demonization. He saved me from the strongholds. He saved me over and over and over again. He made me free because the thing is, he doesn't just make us free. The word says who the sun sets free is free indeed. And the second year of my walk, I got the indeed part. I got the indeed part. Because he is the chain breaker. He is the miracle worker. He is the deliverer. He is the healer. John 8 verses 31 through 32. He says, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And then that verse I just referenced who the sun sets free is free in ge- indeed. John 8, 36. So again, he doesn't just make you free. Jesus doesn't just make you free. He makes you free indeed. And that freedom comes from knowing the truth, which is his name, Jesus. Jesus is truth himself. And the Bible says God is love and Jesus is God. So to know the truth To know Jesus is to know the love of God. And that perfect love casts out all fear. And so I pray tonight that you would know the truth. And you would know how much he loves you. Because it's all contingent on his love. It's all contingent on his love. And so hang out with us in the chat. I'll answer some questions. I'm just going to say a quick prayer for all of you. I'm not going to, I did a deliverance last week. I don't, I don't want to do that right now. I don't feel like the Holy Spirit's leading me to do that right now because actually, yeah, uh, you got to get in your prayer closet tonight and you, some of you have to really come before God and say, Lord, I need you to circumcise my heart. I need you to, so actually he, he does, I'm not going to pray for you right now at all. This is how the Lord is leading. I'm not, you have to go pray. You have to seek the Lord. You have to go get your own oil right now, okay? I'm not going to pour any oil on you. Like, go get your own oil. Go ask him to circumcise your heart. Go lay yourself on the ta- on the, on the the surgical table and ask him to perform open heart surgery on you and say, remove any lies, remove any pride, remove any doubt, remove any unbelief, remove anything that is not of you, God, any false doctrine, any heresy, any religion, anything that is keeping me from experiencing the totality of what you paid for on the cross and remove the blinders. Just come before him, just so humble and hungry. It says he exalts the humble. Remember that. So go pray tonight when we get off the live chat go pray and just ask him ask him never be too good for him to just give you something fresh and not fresh as like it's new revelation just fresh understanding because maybe you don't even realize it that you may have been blind and you just need him to remove the murk from your eyes so all that, all that said, let's uh, hang out in the chat for a little bit. Um, yeah. So, what did you guys think of that, of that testimony, of the second year of my walk with Christ? We went a lot shorter this this time, which was my goal. I didn't want to go another three hours. <laughs> that was crazy. It's the longest stream I've ever done last week. Um, if you feel led, um, if you are blessed by this stream, if you're blessed by, if you're blessed by, by any of my content, please just pray on and consider partnering with the ministry. There are ways to do so in the pinned comment here. Uh, partnering monthly is the first option is definitely most helpful. Uh, you know, but there's a multitude of ways to do it. One time, I have Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, all of the things. Maybe I'll 
check as we go and do some shout outs. I'll check all the, uh, I'll check donor box. I'll check cash app and I'll check Venmo to see if you guys sew anything. But first we'll hang out in the chat for a little bit, but yeah, please sew into the ministry. If you've been blessed by it, it supports what we're doing here and it supports the family. So thank you so much in advance for that. Coming in hot with the questions. First one is, how do I see the spiritual world? <laughs> um, someone said, I like donating through YouTube. That's sweet, but it's honestly, um, you need the Cash App link. Why is that not there? That's annoying. My Cash App is Angela Marie Scafidi. Um, Can you type that out, Mike, my Cash App? It's just my, it's just my full name. Is Angela Marie Scafidi. And yeah, so someone said, I like donating through YouTube. That's nice. And if the, if that's the only way for you to donate through, then by all means, but YouTube does take like 30%. So it's definitely more ideal for you to sew into us in another way. Uh, do you believe in financial sewing? Like, is it a spiritual thing? Not just a phrase. Um, yeah, I mean, I believe that, you know, money is a resource and we can sew into things that we believe in with the kingdom resource, right? Because God is the provider. And so using the resources that he has provided for the things that we believe in, in his name. Yeah. I absolutely believe that there's like a spiritual undertone to that. I always sew into, you know, there's, there's stuff I've been praying on at the church that I attend. And whenever I sew into the church, I always sew into that church with like a prayer for that church because I'm sh what I'm doing is I'm showing God with my with my tithe that I I I believe he is faithful to complete or or to come through on the prayer request the promise to move in that church in a way that I know is his will because it's his word and so whenever I sow into that I'm doing it in faith that he's going to provide um yeah could a demon cause me to doubt my salvation? 100%. 100%. Absolutely. 100%. How do I know if I've had demonic forces around me or not? Um, Venmo link not working for me. Venmo name. It's, I don't know why those links don't work. Um, my Venmo is also Angela Marie Scafidi, I believe. No, it's not. Yes, it is. <laughs> my Venmo and my Cash App are both Angela Marie Scafidi. No, praying deliverance is not dangerous for others if you are a spirit-filled believer. Uh Thoughts on Yoni Steam? I don't know what that is or who that is. Your speaking during your testimonies are always inspiring and speaks to my spirit through Jesus. Praise God, Kaylee. Oh, back to your question, Kaylee. Um, how do I know if I have demonic forces around me or not? Because I'm not sure. I'm new to my walk with Jesus. So uh, go back and listen to my first testimony and go through that prayer at the end of it. But you would know because there's typically fear. Fear and doubt don't come from God. And unbelief don't come from God. We know if it's antithetical to the Holy Spirit, if it contradicts what the Holy Spirit says in Scripture, and God says he has not given us a spirit of fear. 
but of power, love, and of sound mind. Three days ago, a manager of faith, I say man, man of faith, manager of faith said, um, someone said the PayPal link isn't working. <laughs> it's so silly. The devil is such a liar. Can you drop my donor box link again, Mike? Just like the full or Emily. Emily's on it too. The full link for donor box, not just the not the tiny URL thing. But anyway. Um, so this person said three days ago I tossed out my Buddha head, my Buddha from my yard. A man in the apartment complex asked why I showed him the cross on my neck and said, I found a real God. He can go. Okay, so what did I'm curious, what did your neighbor say? All right, I'm going to start to check some of these, see if there's anything. Oops. Uh, cool. Hi, hi, Clint Baldwin. Thank you. Thank you, Clint. This is my first time reading them out loud, so it's... Thank you... Kaylina, thank you. Catherine. Catherine Chetta. <laughs> Chetta. Chetta. Kathleen, Catherine Chetta. Thanks for the Chetta. <laughs> that was... <laughs> but I'm... <tss. laughs> You see, people get excited when Nayla's in the chat because they're always, they just like associate us together. It's just funny. Like, hi, Nayla's here. Boy, oh boy, Nayla. I think. What is your thoughts on dream catchers or sugar skulls? I heard they are demonic. Yes. If you have those, get rid of them now. Get rid of them now. Get rid of them now. Joanna Marie, thank you. Get rid of them. How, oh, this is a sweet question. How have you and your husband been doing as new parents? We're great. We love being parents. We just look at her. We stare at her every day in such awe. I say like five times a day, I can't believe that you're real because I really can't. Like, She's been here for almost three months and I still can't believe that she's like an act, like she exists. It's, it's crazy. Thank you guys. How to bring up crystals to my stepsister who hasn't told my mom about it because she knows she's a Christian, but her toddler, that's so frustrating. The toddler has night terrors and it's because of the crystals in the house. How to bring up the crystals. Um, Brittany Jorgensen, have you prayed on that? I would pray on that first. How to bring up the crystals to my stepsister who hasn't told my mom. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think of like what a good, how a good way to approach that would be. Honestly, truth hurts. Just tell her, just tell her, just say, Hey, Hey, you want your son, just say, look, I, you want your son to stop being tormented, right? Yes. Okay. Can I, can I tell you something that I need you to receive? I need you to receive with love. Like I, I need you to just hear me. It might make you upset. Is that okay? Sure. And then just tell her, say, look, these crystals, they, they, they are portals for a demonic influence. I know that sounds crazy, but 
what I want you, oh, this is good. What I want you to do is not take my word for it. I want you to take your son's word for it and how scared he is. Because look, it, it you got to just pray that that's, that's going to, that's going to pierce the heart. I'm struggling to find a church with a good balance of deep Bible preaching while also not being cessationist. Oh, I see what you mean. Well, um, that's not hard, honestly. I don't know where you're located. It does make a difference where you're located. Like the church that I went to the first year of my walk, it was a Cal it was Calvary. And I feel like Calvary, everyone knows what Calvary is just Every week, you know, you, you, know you're, you know what you're getting when you go there. They go through the word, word by word, which is great. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't know if they're cessationists, but they certainly don't operate in the gifts of the spirit. But there's nothing wrong, per se, with a church like that. It's just that it got to a point for me where it's like I, I wasn't being fed anymore because... Again, we use the scripture as a description rather than a prescription. So just pray that God will give you a church. It says, again, he's a good father. If you ask him for a fish, he's not going to give you a snake. Uh, thank you, Brianna. Thank you, Morgan. Yay, Morgan. Morgan says in her message, along with her donation, that she's seeking deliverance and she's going to check out a place on the deliverance map this weekend. Oh, good, Morgan. That's amazing. What? Oh, so, oh, Cheryl sent 25 on YouTube. Thank you, Cheryl. I, I can't see that for some reason. But thank you very much. What should I say to this? Someone said, Angela, we are at war with the devil. Are, are we at war with the devil every day? Yeah, but we're at war from a place of victory because Jesus is awesome. So hallelujah. So next week, I love you too, Nayla. Next week, we are doing a live stream with Nayla again and Brian from Demon Erasers. Who, if you guys don't know Brian, I found him through um, Rhett and Link's YouTube channel. Good Mythical Morning. Me and Mike watch them sometimes. Like, they just eat food. And I always pray for them because I learned, like, we had been watching them for a couple months. And then I learned that they're both apostates <laughs> and have, like, walked away from the faith that they were raised in. And it grieves my heart. So I always pray for them, but they just like their YouTube channels, like they just do silly things. Like they just try different foods and things. So I found Brian from, from them actually, oddly enough, he was on one of their episodes, like, because they were playing Dungeons and Dragons and they were like, and it, I forget the whole thing, but they would, they were like, wanted to invite an exorcist on. And so they invited Brian from TikTok and they were kind of like using him almost like, um, they were like poking fun at him almost. And me and Mike were sitting there. Like, you can tell that they're trying to make fun of the guy. Me and Mike are sitting there like, and Mike says, is it just me or is this guy kind of cool? And I was like, yeah, I'm looking him up right now. And then and then I found him and we uh, we connected. He's awesome. He's Demon Erasers on Instagram. He's going to be on with me and Nayla and him are all going to do a expose of yoga. So look forward to that. Oh, Kevin says soon she'll have King Cat on. Yes. Please come back on the show. Um, 
I don't, I don't, I never know what to talk about with Kevin, guys, because I always want Kevin back on the show, but he's so smart that there's too many topics. There's, just, there are too many things. There are too many things. <laughs> if there's anything that you guys, if you follow Kevin, he's KingCat2.0 on Instagram. If, if there's anything that he talks about that you want to see us talk about, please let us both know. Someone said, Angela, Alexandra Pagani wrote books on deliverance and one on generational curses. Yes, and I recommend those. And TJ just bought, just wrote a book too. My, the guy that we were just talking about, my like spiritual father, he wrote a book called Soul Shaker. And it's a practical guide how to cast out demons. It's like very thin. So you can, um, that you can like, it's easily palpable. Soul Shaker. Write that by TJ O'Donnell. He also has another book coming out in a couple weeks, his testimony. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> We're going to the release party in a couple weeks. I'm really excited. Any other exposés you plan to do other than yoga? Yeah, all the things, all the time, of course. I'm working. Really? That's so cool. TJ's on Barnes and Noble. Um, <laughs> an expose that I have planned is on tarot. That's going to be coming soon. All right, I will get to off here in another couple of minutes. Just another couple of minutes. Thank you guys. Please be sure to, um, what about Kanye West? I just did a video on him, y'all. Check that out. About his recent um, denouncing of Christianity. Unfortunate denouncing of Christianity. Christianity. Thank you, Robert Fernandez, for the donation. Um, I used to read tarot, but God prevented me from remembering the meanings. That's good. That's good. Praise God. Someone's. I, I know like a little bit about him. I don't know much. What about Jenny Weaver? I would love to have Jenny on the show. I really would. Yeah. Well, yeah, Nayla, I'm working on that. I mean, this was like kind of the first part of that, like the springboard, like an expose on the godly authentic versus the biblical counterfeit. This is, you know, the springboard of that because everything in new age is, is a, is a counter, is a counterfeit. Everything. Tarot is a counterfeit prophecy. Astrology is counterfeit prophecy. Astrology is counterfeit. Um, also counterfeit just like God's purposes for the stars and moon and the sun. Someone said, when will Mike be on? When will Mike be on? <laughs> He's just staring at me. Thank you, Matthew Parsons, for the donation. <laughs> like, I joke around a lot. My husband will come on when he's ready. That's all. I used to want him, I, it used to stress me out how bad I wanted him to come on, but, like, so much has happened from back then between now that, like, I'm glad he hasn't yet because, like, his testimony and his intimacy with God is only, like, developing and it's just really beautiful and we have some awesome things like coming in the future <laughs> yeah reiki is a counterfeit laying on hands for sure nayla said when will mike be look at nayla's comment when will mike be on uh, No, we don't want Mike on Testimony Tuesday. We want Mike. 
We want Mike on the live stream with his wife. That's... <laughs> Taoism is extremely dumb, or extremely counterfeit. It's a watered down version of the Garden of Eden. Everything is a counter. The devil is a copycat. He is so boring. He's not a creator. Congrats on growing on a growing family. Thank you guys. We love our baby. Do you want to get Sela? <laughs> Here's your exclusive. Here's your first debut. You guys, maybe we'll see if Sayla wants to come on, and then that's how I'll say goodbye. <laughs> Would you guys want to see the baby? Nayla says, I love seeing you two flirt. Nayla, we miss you. No, yeah, I know, Brittany. Yeah, he said he he was. We were missing the fifty third week. Um, he, he's. I mean, if that's how he wants to do it, he can do it that way. But I don't want. I I my desire. To, I don't want him to wait until week fifty three of twenty twenty four to share his testimony. And um, yeah. We are, okay, so I, while we're on this note, I am missing, okay, I had two people from Testimony Tuesday reach out to me and ask me not to post their testimonies. So I'm short three, guys. My completed project of 2024, I am now short three. Can you type yes in the chat if you would like to submit your testimony for Testimony Tuesday to fill one of those three slots? of how you came to know Christ, how you were delivered and baptized, just type yes in the chat and um, I will, I'll get in contact with you after this, okay? Because it's just, I mean, we put even in the email, we put like that, you know. She's eating. Oh, the baby's eating? Yeah, so I'll, I'll get that. Oh. He says, he says, Sayla's eating, so he brought... He brought an old favorite. Oh, <laughs> he brought. Hi, <laughs> everyone. Remember, remember, Jemmy. Oh, that's good. She took the bottle. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Yeah, my baby's had. Um, sh she's been exclusively exclusively breastfed, which is all that I've wanted. Okay, some people are typing yes. Um. What? So, those of you that are typing yes in the chat, Mike, can you leave my email in the chat right now? For what? They're going to email me their testimonies for the missing time slots. Um, Jem and Ruby. <laughs> um, so, just type in my email, heavenandhealingpodcast at gmail.com. So, just that one so those of you that said yes do me a favor email me like a short version of your testimony at gmail.com and e like i don't know 300 words less kind of thing and then i will get back to you and i will tell you the next steps what will be required of you from that point forward just so you know so you know what you're signing up for you will have to record a video that is a half hour long at most of your testimony and then I will give you a link to download it to and then Mike and I edit it from there. So that's what you're signing up for. Tell them not to edit. Do not edit anything. Mike says don't edit anything. Shoot. Just shoot it and then just send it. Start to finish. So email me. He just dropped my email. Email me that like short version just so I know what it is. <laughs> And then I will give you the next steps from there. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Someone said I totally would if I had a better ending. It's a work in progress. We're all a work in progress. That's my testimony. A year from now will look different than it does now.
another time. We'll, sh we'll show baby Sayla another time. Yeah, so as I was saying, she's been exclusively breastfed, which is what I wanted. Um, and so with that, I just like haven't wanted to pump like it. Anytime I tried to pump, it was a hassle. It's just annoying. Like I, I'm already feeding her a lot. I don't want to pump too. It's just annoying. And so she wasn't getting a bottle. I have the privilege to be home with her. So it wasn't necessary. But for these live streams, I was like, well, she should take a bottle so that when, because my mom watches her when we do this. And so she should take a bottle then. But she just hasn't taken one. She just has refused it. We've tried so many times. But just yesterday, um, she finally took it. She finally took the bottle. And so Mike just went to go check and she's eating right now. Praise God. Praise God because I prayed about that. Like I prayed, Holy Spirit, please help her take the bottle. Um, and so it's just nice to have that option because I don't want her to be bottle fed like if she doesn't have to be. I love feeding her. I love the bond. It's just like when I do the live streams, it's so nice. And, um, you know, Mike and I, our first anniversary, our one year anniversary is coming up on April 25th. And we had it in our minds, that which is two weeks from now, by the way. Yay. We had it in our minds that would be our first night out without the baby, which kind of like makes me sad. I kind of, I kind of want her to come. <laughs> he booked us reservations somewhere special. I have to dress up. Kind of where? It's, it's nice. Nice. Cool. Am I going to like it? Okay. <laughs> Uh, yay. So I guess Sayla can't come because it's just like Wing! in the middle of a nice restaurant. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that'll be nice for her to have that, that, that night when we, when we go out our first time without her. Oh my goodness gracious. My baby, my baby. I love her so much guys. All right, I'm just checking one more time to see if there's any any more donations. Angel. Oh, what a beautiful name you have. Angel Lorenzana. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor Morden. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you all who donated. That's so nice. Please keep the ministry in your prayers and keep the provision or the Lord's provision of the ministry in your prayers. Um, and again, check out soulshakerbook.com. That's TJ's Practical Guide to Casting Out Demons. And yeah, all right. I think I I think that's that's I think that's it's free. Oh wow, oh sweet. All right. Well, I think that that does it. That this was a good stream. We didn't go three hours like I uh, did last week. That was incredibly long. <laughs> but please, y'all, um, share this video, please. Please share my content on Instagram. It really helps with the algorithm. Um, all my reels and things. Share these videos to your story and tag me so that I too can share it. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you, Keela. That's so nice. Thank you so much, Keela. Um, I like your name. And please like, share, and subscribe like okay let me like this video share this video subscribe to the channel <laughs> thank y'all so much all right well jesus loves you correct there are no christian mediums good night <laughs>